call her for anything. She would call me for things. Um, we just developed a really, really good working relationship. So when I wanted to do this sim uh, sim uh, series, I said, Susie, would you co-host with me? Because I said, what I won't think of, she will. What she doesn't, I will. We do think kind of alike. Um, we feed off of each other all the time. We've been in numerous <coughs> clubs and meetings. So um, we wanted to have this for the simple reason that we deal in home health with so many people that do not know the resources or have the information that they need when it comes to making decisions about your health, your family's health, your parents' health. So we wanted to host this so that it's an informational meeting. So our first speaker, and we didn't ever get in any trouble either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Her and I were kind of the wild card. <laughs> we'll put it that way. We weren't always so big. Okay, so this is Veronica <clears throat> from Haskell Hot, and she's going to talk about uh, funeral, and she's going to talk. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see a big crowd. The road of life is filled with important milestones, major events and achievements that help define who we are and what's important to us. Events such as graduation, marriage, childbirth, new jobs, career changes, and retirement. Those are universal moments that bring families together to celebrate those significant accomplishments that require careful planning and financial commitment. But what about funerals? What about your end of life events? Where do they fit on your list of your life's milestones? Good morning, my name is Veronica Haskell and my husband Bert and I own Haskell Hot Funeral Homes here in Princeville, Wyoming and Toulon. We are so pleased that you took time out of your busy lives to be a part of what we hope will be a very helpful and useful event these next four weeks as you begin to prepare or are already in the throes of preparing for the golden years of your lives. Let's face it, I don't think any of us really want to talk about getting old. What comes along with elderly life and ultimately our death. But obviously you all are thinking about this period of time in your life, your own mortality, and wanting to take the necessary steps to plan for the later years if you are here this morning. We hope with the experienced and diverse panel of professionals that will be speaking throughout this program that each of you will leave with a sense of peace and confidence that you can move forward knowing that you have the tools to begin planning and making decisions for your golden years. It is from our own personal experience with my grandmother that fueled Bert and I with the passion for hosting and becoming part of events such as this one that focus on the senior years of our lives, educating and informing our community about the importance of getting your ducks in a row and encouraging you to think about pre-planning your final arrangements. And most importantly, <coughs> discuss them with those that are left behind to take care of your affairs once you are gone. My grandfather passed away suddenly of a massive heart attack in the kitchen after breakfast one morning in 2008. And as much as he loved and adored my grandmother for 62 years, he didn't leave her financially prepared to take care of herself for the remaining years of her life. He had three very small life insurance policies that barely covered his funeral expenses and not much money in savings for her to use to live her remaining years. But this wasn't intentional. He was the product of growing up in the Depression. He served in World War II, 
and saving money for retirement and their golden years wasn't something that generation typically thought about. Most of them lived paycheck to paycheck and had just enough for their daily living, let alone think about stashing money away for decades down the road. My grandmother immediately wanted to sell the house and move into an independent living complex where she could be around other people and have someone available 24 hours a day if she were to need anything. She was in the throes of her grief from losing my grandfather because he was supposed to outlive her. And she was attempting to make a life-changing decision about where she wanted to move after being in the home that he built for them and that they lived together for 60 years. The first senior apartment complex she chose was beautiful. It had all the amenities she could have ever needed. Two bedrooms, convenient elevator, every evening for her, a shuttle to drive her to and from her appointments, the grocery store outings, it had social events, it even had a hair salon. It was much nicer than their small, modest home from which she lived for six decades. Unfortunately, my grandmother's decision to move <clears throat> here was based on emotion and was not thought out as well as it should have been. And it didn't matter what my mother or myself said to my grandmother, she was moving and no one was stopping her. A year into her new life at the apartment, my mother had to have the difficult conversation with her and tell her that she can't continue to live there anymore because she quite simply couldn't afford it. She was running out of money quickly. And so began several years of moving my grandmother to three more assisted living facilities and her ending up in a nursing home and unfortunately running out of money and trying to get on Medicaid. Never ever in her life did she think she would pass away first nor did she think she would outlive the savings and the retirement income that she had to live off of every month. As her health and her funds began to decline, we needed to make sure she had her financial affairs in order to live out the remaining months, maybe years, and we needed to make sure that her funeral and burial expenses were covered. It was extremely challenging for us to have these conversations with her because at that time she was no longer in the state of mind or health to be able to discuss these important topics. This monumental task of trying to get her approved for Medicaid took over two years. We had to meet with the funeral home and prepay for her funeral and sign the irrevocable assignment form so the state of Illinois wouldn't consider that policy as an asset and take it away after her death. The countless hours my mother spent on the phone, the multiple times we had to send and resend documents proving <clears throat> my grandmother's income, her savings, her assets, was taking a toll on my mom and me as well. And do you know her Medicaid card finally arrived the day after she died. Oftentimes my mother and I commented to each other that if her and my grandfather had been just a bit more proactive while they were still healthy, that maybe the burdens that were left to us wouldn't have been as large. And ironically, the process of all of this was a tad bit less stressful for our family just because we are funeral professionals and we know how to handle end of life planning for a Medicaid spend down and understand the pre-funding options for funerals. After my grandmother passed away, my mother said, I cannot imagine having gone through all of this without us being so knowledgeable and us being so proactive and helping her get my grandmother's affairs in order. My grandparents would be very saddened to know that their lack of planning for their end of life caused my mom and I such stress. How 
However, what this did was open our eyes that as we age, there is much pre-planning that can be done while we are still healthy, of sound mind and body, and in a financial position to plan for our senior years. So now that you understand the importance of pre-planning your end-of-life affairs, and you know that you do not want to leave your loved ones to face a situation such as the ones we faced with my grandparents, and ones that some of you more than likely have already faced yourself, what is the first step? Step one, decide what funeral home you want to care for you and your family. Make an appointment to sit down and to discuss your options with them. There are many options out there when it comes to funeral service professionals. And each funeral home does operate very differently and they offer various types of services that others may not. Go talk to them. Find out what funeral home meets your family's needs. Number two, decide what your final disposition will be. Do you want your body buried or would you prefer your body cremated? Either before or after your services? And if so, where will your final place of rest be? A cemetery? Your family farm? A lake? An ocean? There are many options out there, and it's our job as funeral service professionals to give you all of this information so you can make this decision now. Please do not leave this for your loved ones left behind. In our business, we call this having the talk of a lifetime. Number three, how do you want to be remembered? What type of remembrance service would be fitting for your loved ones that will be grieving your loss? And please, Please, do not look at your loved ones and say, don't do anything. Your memorial and your funeral service really isn't for you. It's about you. However, it's for your loved ones left behind. And we know it's the beginning of their process of grief. And it is important that you give them the gift of allowing them to honor you in the way they need to. Not doing anything doesn't stop the grief if that's what your intention is. It only makes it worse. And it can actually cause significant delayed grief. Some of you may know that I am a certified funeral celebrant. I officiate services of remembrance in a unique and personal way. A professional storyteller, if you may. I weave the deceased's life together in a service that is fitting for them. And I cannot tell you how many times I have been approached after a service by someone who did nothing for their loved one because that is what they said they wanted and they were honoring their wishes. But over time, doing nothing became a burden. Their grief remained stagnant and they had guilt, sadness, and unfortunately regret over doing nothing. This is the time in your life when you can sit down with your loved ones and ask them, what do you think you may need after I pass away? How do you want to remember me? Yes, folks, these are difficult conversations to have. 
But let's face it, none of us are going to escape the end of our lives. Time goes so fast and it seems to pick up speed the older we get. Why put off till tomorrow what you can get taken care of today? Number four. Once decisions have been discussed with your funeral service professional, get an estimate on how much your death-related expenses are going to be. Ask questions. We are here to help you and no question is ever a silly one. We know that families have options out there when it comes to which funeral home they would like to handle their final arrangements. This is not a decision that should be taken lightly and is one that we as funeral service professionals guide people through every single day. Number five. Discuss the possibility of prepaying for your funeral services and its benefits for, with your funeral service professional. Our job is to be transparent and not leave any questions. Most people do not know that when someone prepays for their funeral, that money is not the funeral homes until the time of death. We must put the money into a funeral specific life insurance policy or open up a funeral and burial trust account for you. Your money will be safe. And by prepaying your funeral at today's costs, you lock in the price of the services and merchandise. The only items that most funeral homes typically won't guarantee are things that we call cash advance items. These are costs that are outside of the funeral home that we cannot control the costs of, such as obituaries, flowers, crematory fees, cremation permits, death certificates, opening and closings of graves, etc. These funding vehicles earn interest over time and that interest is used to go towards the rising cost of the funeral service. These are all important items that we will discuss with you and whomever else that you bring with you to your pre-planning meeting. And number six, write everything down especially if you are not prepaying. Pre-planning meetings are a way that we can begin building the file of your final wishes and decisions that you have made. We will take down all the necessary information to file your death certificate, compose your obituary, and carry out your wishes. We will keep a file of your end of life arrangements and we highly encourage you to do so as well. And most importantly, let someone know where that file is in the event of your death. You will relieve an immense burden from those left behind by making these decisions ahead of time. Do not leave your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your siblings to try to decide what you may have wanted when it comes to your method of disposition and your remembrance service. Many people are hesitant to include funerals when discussing other important life moments because talking openly and honestly about death may be considered taboo and if we don't talk about it then maybe it just won't happen. As a result, too many well-intentioned <coughs> friends and family die unprepared, leaving their loved ones with a painful, emotional, and financial burdens. 
And if you haven't financially prepared for your end of life expenses, <coughs> do not expect the state of Illinois to cover those costs. There are minimal funds available for those receiving public assistance, and unfortunately, those programs are regularly cut. And funeral homes are now being put in a very difficult position of having to turn families away because the minimal financial contribution from the state isn't being reimbursed to them in a reasonable time frame for the work that they have had to do. It costs money to be born, and it costs money to die. Do not leave these, these decisions and this burden on your loved ones. The average family has to answer over 100 detailed questions within 48 hours of losing a loved one. Most must make these decisions with a heavy heart, and have very little time to think about details and prices. With average funeral costs rising two to three percent annually, like every other industry, families can be left in a very difficult predicament if caught unprepared. Like the rest of life's major milestones, funerals require detailed, deliberate, logistical and financial planning, no matter what type of disposition or services you choose. People spend a year on average planning the details for their wedding day. They take time to really think about all of the specifics, what kind of clothes they want to wear, what kind of music they want played, who should be in their wedding party, which flowers they should have, where the ceremony should take place, and of course, how are we gonna pay for it all? It's an important event in a person's life that should be, and almost never is, planned on the fly. Think about it. How many weddings are really planned in two days? A funeral should be treated the same way. The average wedding in the United States today costs $30,000. The average funeral costs 12. There are an average of 2.3 million weddings per year, and there are an average of 2 million deaths per year. Also, please take the step of creating a If you do not, and you pass away without one, I'm here to tell you the state of Illinois will have one for you. And I can assure you that your estate more than likely will not be handled the way that you would have wanted it. Be an advocate for yourself and your family. Do this now. It is the only way to plan for your belongings. But your end of life decisions are so much more than distributing property. It's a reflection of a person's legacy and it's an opportunity for bereaved friends and family to come together to begin the healing process. And by taking time to prearrange all the details of your funeral, you can ensure that it will be an event that truly represents your life. Funeral planning is the missing milestone for most people, and it really should be an important part of everyone's long-term blueprint. No matter your age, your health status, or where you live, your wedding more than likely wasn't planned overnight, and neither should your final wishes. Pre-arranging and pre-funding your funeral, no matter how simple or elaborate, no matter what type of disposition you choose, is a smart investment for your family. It is a memorable event 
It is one they will always remember. I have never had a family sit down at an arrangement conference after their loved one has passed away and say to us, I can't imagine having to make all these decisions right now and in such a short amount of time. I'm so glad this was taken care of ahead of time. Pre-planning for your final arrangements truly is the best last gift that you can give your family. Peace of mind for everyone comes with being prepared. And that you cannot put a price on. Thank you. They'd like me to open up the floor for any questions that any of you might have. Yes. I several years ago I had a lady tell me that she and her husband wrote down their obituaries because their children wouldn't know all the things that uh, meetings and things that they were in. And so my husband and I sat down and did that 20 years ago. And I gave it to us. Yeah. I, I, I sent it in, I gave it to them. Great. And so then when my husband passed away, we didn't have anything to worry about because you had all the information. Exactly. That right there is the reason why you need to do exactly what she did. Yes? The money, if you prearrange and you prepay, you know, for your funeral. Yes. That money goes into a fund, but where's the fund? Is it guaranteed by the government or is, I mean, so if I send it into a nursing home, a nursing home, a funeral home, sorry for that, um, it, and they file for bankruptcy, am I losing? No. So again, the money's not the funeral homes until the time of death. We have to do something with that money. The funeral home has the choice whether they want to put it into a trust or whether they want to put it into a funeral-specific life insurance policy. Our funeral home chooses to work with Pekin Life Insurance. They are local. They have been around here forever. My agent is a text away if I need him. And we know your money is safe. So there are several pieces of paperwork that you fill out. You have to designate a beneficiary and a contingent beneficiary. Um, you actually write your check to the funeral home because that is your paper trail if you are going on a spend down for Medicaid that you have actually prepaid for your funeral. But we don't deposit that check into our account. It is sent in with the paperwork and your, if it's a trust that we open, you'll get that paperwork, or if it's the Pekin Life Insurance Policy, so you will get a copy of your paperwork from the company, we will have a copy at the funeral home, and the company has a copy, and they will send you annual statements showing um, the growth of your policy with interest. These policies are called portable, because let's say you uh, decide, I'm tired of these Illinois winters, we're packing up, we're moving to Florida, and we're changing our whole end of life plan. Your policy goes with you. You can go to any funeral home you choose, just because you prearranged it with us, doesn't mean you have to do your services with us. However, another funeral home might not guarantee the contract or the prices that we are guaranteeing you. Now, I can't imagine a funeral home turning away a pre-funded funeral anywhere, uh, but that would be a decision for them to make based on the costs. Very good question. Yes? Okay, you said you put it in a trust or with Pekin Insurance. Pekin Insurance, does that draw interest? Yes. And where is the trust? Is it at the bank? So we use a trust company called Cooperative Funeral Fund and they are a funeral <coughs> trust company. We try to put a majority of our monies into peak and life insurance, and there are some stipulations depending on your age if we have to open an annuity or do a life insurance. Both of these policies earn interest, and the funeral home retains the interest 
to use towards those expenses that have gone up. For example, the average obituary right now in the Peoria Journal Star is about $450. If you live 10 more years, let's say that, obit that obituary might be six or 700. <coughs> the interest that your policy is using, Letter. is earning, we will use to offset these costs of some of these items that are rising in cost so then your family doesn't have to come up, hopefully, with any out-of-pocket expenses. Very good question. Do you uh, do a uh, cremation? Yes, any funeral home can handle your services just because a funeral home doesn't own the actual retort doesn't mean that they cannot handle your disposition. Our funeral home currently does not have a crematory yet. Uh, we have a business plan and we have some wheels in motion. Um, no promises though, uh, but we work with a crematory in Peoria um, called Morgan Jones and they only work with the funeral homes um, and the coroner's office. They perform the cremations for us. Uh, we actually are down there on a regular basis. We see their facility. I can assure you if I needed to use them for my family, that is where I would go. So that is who we use currently. Uh, if while we, you know, don't have don't have our, our own uh, retort, those uh, those chambers are very 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 expensive. And so for a small funeral home like us and many others out in the country to be putting up these structures that cost uh, probably somewhere between one hundred and two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Plus you have all the OSHA regulations that you have to get into, and you have the communities that might not want people burning bodies in their town, but yet more and more people are choosing <laughs> cremation, so you guys are kind of putting us in a difficult predicament here. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we handle all the services. We just take the bodies uh, to, the, to the crematory in Peoria. Very good question. Yes? The average person can go into a financial institution and open their own funeral trust account. Why would uh, your alternative be better than that one? Does it have to do with the Medicaid spend down? Well, you have to make sure that that policy has an irrevocable assignment because if it doesn't have an irrevocable assignment and the person that is on public aid passes away, the state will consider that an asset and they will take it away from them, leaving the family members to uh, pay for the funeral. The second thing is the only way a funeral home is going to lock in their price is if you pre-fund it with them. So if you have a burial trust account with a trust fund out on your own, that's wonderful. But you're going to pay the price, your family is going to have to use that account and pay the current prices when you pass away. And with the rise in funerals going up two to three percent a year, uh, if you live another five, ten plus years, you know that that's a lot of money that your family will probably have to come up with out of pocket. And it won't count towards the Medicaid spend down. Correct. Correct. Okay. <coughs> well, I don't want to take up. Oh, yes. You, you mentioned that uh, the average funeral is twelve thousand dollars. Yes. What's the average cremation? It depends. That's a very good question mm -hmm. because a lot of people are still choosing to have their body prepared for an open casket. And so there are some added expenses with that for the body, the, the preparation, the embalming, the rental casket. Plus you still have to pay for the cremation part of it as well. Um, people can go to a direct cremation place and get something at a minimal cost. Those are questions and places that you should go visit now because these are the, the things that you want to find out. How are they going to take care of your family when you pass away? With us being a full service funeral home, we offer a lot of things throughout the year that your direct cremation societies don't offer. You know, we do community events. We host a holiday service of remembrance where we invite the bereaved back to our funeral home who have passed away that particular <coughs> year. We are out in your communities supporting the places that you all live. And yes, there are less expensive options out there, 
um, you just have to go and, and talk with them and see if that is the fit that would be good for your family. Typically, if you just do um, a cremation with no viewing of the body or anything, um, you know, you have to decide whether you're going to do a visitation, whether there's going to be a burial of your ashes. If there is, there's going to be cemetery costs and vehicle costs. So you're probably looking at six to seven thousand. If you do a cremation instead of a viewing of the body. Well, that's that's Yes, if you still have a visitation, you have services, and we process to a cemetery, and you have your cemetery fees, and, and that sort of thing, yes. Yes? Do you have a, a guesstimate of cremations as opposed to uh, standard burials? So, last year? Yes. So, when, when my husband got into the industry back in 1994, cremation, uh, I'm sorry, 1997. Um, cremation was about 10%. Um, the average uh, cremation across the United States now is pushing, I think last year it was pushing upwards of, I think, closer to 60. However, it's based geographical. I'll be honest with you. In Arizona, their creation cremation rate is much higher. Uh, for a multitude of reasons. People are retiring out there and passing away and they're being cremated and their loved ones are, are typically bringing their cremations home as opposed to maybe bringing their whole body home. Um, states like California are very progressive and they have the green funerals and you can have funerals in your house and there just is all different kinds of things you can do. So. Um, we are still very traditional here uh, in the Midwest, folks. Our funeral home is about, I would say last year, we were around 60% um, burial, and we were around 40% or so cremation. But it doesn't mean that those people who chose cremation weren't having services for their loved ones. And this is where the biggest misconception has happened with cremation over the years. Cremation doesn't equal no services. You only have two ways you can be disposed of, burial or cremation. Your services shouldn't change, ladies and gentlemen, just because you chose to have your body cremated as opposed to as opposed to a buried. We have a question on Facebook of how does one go about purchasing a burial plot? Um, they need to contact the sexton of their local cemetery. And if they do not know who that sexton is, if there's a funeral home in town, typically that funeral home should know who the sexton is. We're Facebook living it, and we got a question, so that's good. <laughs> Anything else? If you pre-plan a funeral with you and say your business goes out of business, what happens to that information? Um, well, that we've had several people answer that question for us. So the, ask that question for us. So the first thing I will say is this funeral home's been around since 1930 and has only had four owners. These owners have been very choosy in who they have sold their funeral homes to. I'm hopeful, folks, that we're not going anywhere for a very long time. Um, if something should happen and we were to have to close our business, we would probably have to take those files and either give them to like the local village or the county clerk um, in the town to manage them. Uh, who knows, we might have to work with the coroners. <laughs> We're not taking them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good question. So um, I don't want to cut anybody short. However, uh, coroner Jamie Hardwood is here, and he has um, some incredibly important information that he needs to share with you. Um, I have a table set up up here with flyers. If, how you want to be remembered, we've got pens, there's funeral planning guides, there's some articles, there's have a, life, have a talk of a lifetime decks of cards that are super fun. Um, and I'll be around afterwards to answer any uh, questions that you uh, may have. And if you want to schedule an appointment to sit down and talk with us, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Our hometown grown boy. <laughs> if anybody in this area needs extra information, we know he's going to respond. I used this to work for her, her, by the way. Yeah. She didn't teach that. <laughs> but he's local. We know who his mom is. So, <laughs> 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 all yours, Jamie. So, Veronica, will you answer my phone if it rings?
Yep, yeah. yeah. I got it. Okay, I'm, I'm on duty. <laughs> I thought about a thousand things uh, when she was talking that had ran through my mind while she was talking with the families that I've worked with. Uh, and I want to promise you this, everything that she said is 100% relevant to where we're at today. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for coming um, on both of our behalves. I think it's wonderful. I love coming back to my hometown. Think about where I grew up, going into a Hammett funeral home when I was a kid and things like that, and just being able to be a part of my community. It's the best part of the job, to be honest. Um, I had a family come in to, I'm going to springboard off of you just for a second. I had a family come into my uh, office yesterday to view their loved one. Uh, her dad had passed away uh, mowing the yard uh, in Peoria, and brought him back to our office. There was no funeral home that had been chosen prior. And one daughter lived in Florida, one lived in Arizona, two in Peoria. They all congregated together yesterday morning in my office with this horrific argument about what we're gonna do with dad. Well, someone's gotta pay for dad, to your point. And very patiently uh, and compassionately, we have this conversation with them and they leave. They're gonna go make a whole bunch of phone calls, they're gonna find a funeral home and they're gonna call us. Well, we have five more deaths yesterday, okay? So now, now we're building up bodies in our morgue. So we call the family back and the daughter from Florida says, we don't have any money, what do we do? Well, now we're stuck because what she talked about, uh, about Medicaid reimbursement, if you don't have any money, it's, a, it's, it's really a farce in the state of Illinois. They're not gonna help, unfortunately. So now, now we're left with, they already came in for their visitation in my office. They've paid their final respects and they're gonna leave dad with me and the Peoria County taxpayers, unfortunately. So it's very, very important to plan. So I just wanted to, to say that. Uh, I spoke last Friday at the Peoria Rotary Club, uh, where I'm actually a member, and there's a, a certain thing you need to know about Rotarians. Rotarians are a lot like Catholics. When the hour is up, they get out and they leave. <laughs> and it's very true. I ran over 20 minutes and not one person got up, so I felt really privileged that they everyone stayed. So one of my goals is to stay on time. I'm watching the clock behind me. Um, I have a lot more time here today than I did with the Rotarians, which is good, because I, I'm like my dad, I like to talk a lot. <laughs> So uh, my goal is to stay on time. Um, I want to tell you about the organizational structure of the coroner's office. I call this kind of like a, a myth buster. This is really what do we do here. Um, why the coroner is called and why we investigate deaths. Uh, the functions of what we do. Uh, I want to touch upon a little bit of the investigative process and what that looks like. And really take you from death to death certificate and what that little pathway looks like because it's really important. And then I'd like to finish with um, something I'm very passionate about, which is organ and tissue donation. If while I'm talking you have any questions, just pop your hand up, okay, if you want. But we'll have plenty of time afterwards to talk um, and ask questions. But if you have anything um, that pops up, uh, just let me know while I'm thinking about while you're thinking about it, okay? So I am a principal uh, uh, native, obviously, class of 1992. Uh, graduated from Methodist School of Nursing in 97, and then uh, completed my bachelor's degree in nursing from Penn State in 2015. Currently working on a master's degree at University of Alabama uh, in nursing administration. Why am I doing this to myself? I don't really know. Um, but the nursing administration education is gonna give me a lot more to offer uh, to my job as coroner as far as um, leadership, um, economics, finances, um, organizational development, things like that. So everything that I learn um, in this curriculum, I'm certainly going to be uh, continuing to apply to my job as coroner of Peoria County because I anticipate um, a second term, hopefully, in 2020. Um, what do I do in my free time? Well, I have a family, obviously, and three children. Um, but out in my community is the best part. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Mayor's Community Coalition Against Heroin. And unless you've been living under a rock, we have an opioid problem here in the state of Illinois and really across the nation. So I get to go out into the public and talk about um, really the opioid epidemic and really how that affects all of us. And if any of you are sitting in here thinks that opioids or, or the epidemic doesn't affect you, it does. Because I'm one of those naive people who didn't think it affected me either. <coughs> but it does. My son that I adopted was born into an opioid family and his mom died of an opioid overdose never imagined it would even touch me so close, but it does. Um, I'm a stakeholder in the uh, Peoria Recovery Project. So the Peoria Recovery Project um, is a community organization that was formed last year 
to go out into the community to talk about opioids, to talk about how it affects someone who maybe had an ankle fracture, that had a prescription for, nar uh, for uh, an opioid, that became addicted. Okay, so that's the goal that. Um, I'm a life-saving leader with the gift of hope. And the gift of hope is the organ and tissue donation um, faculty uh, here in our area. I donated a kidney uh, in 2012 to a friend of mine. So I have a really, really big stage in the fact that life does go on. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things here, but I think uh, you guys want to get to the meat early, right? <laughs> I could go on and on. Uh, the coroner's office is located at 506 East Seneca Place, and that's over in the East Bluff uh, in Peoria. So if you shoot north, uh, south down Knoxville and go all the way down to Forest Hill, Bust the left onto Forest Hill, go down a couple blocks, and turn right onto California, you're gonna find us in the old juvenile detention center building. Uh, it's all cinder block building, so I have to run out of my office outside and answer my phone, which is horrible. Uh, they, they used to be located out of Proctor uh, before my time, and then they moved into the JDC because the county at the time thought that would be cheaper than building a freestanding coroner's office. I can assure you that it probably wasn't the most appropriate thing to do for what we do every day. And once I finish telling you about it all, you're gonna understand why I said what I just said. We have four full-time uh, coroner deputies um, that uh, work out of the office uh, uh, Monday through Friday. Um, and I have four part-time uh, that work the nights and the weekends um, opposite uh, those individuals. It's difficult to schedule, to be honest. Um, you can plan, if we look at epidemiology or the statistics of where we're at in our community, and the aging of our population. We can predict that people are gonna die, right? That's, that's one thing that you said, you know, birth and death are the, the two only universal experiences we're gonna have in common. We're all going to die. That's just reality, right? It's gonna happen. So I can predict from 2016 to 2017, our death reports, which means when someone calls our office and says, hey, we have a dead person, from 2016 to 17 rose 10%. Okay, from 2016 to 2017, it rose 10%. What do you think is happening right now? We're 10% higher right now than where we were last year at this time on reports. Our workload is tremendous, okay? And if you've paid attention to, to city government and county government and in Peoria particularly and in Peoria County, nobody has any money anymore because of sales tax revenue. So it's a problem. So we just met with my county administrator yesterday, the elected official. I'm like digressing a little bit, and I'm sorry. Uh, but we're going to have to cut this, this, and this for next year in 18. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, my deaths are going to go up 10%. People are going to die. So um, we have to work with our budget very, very tightly. Last year, I laid off my administrative assistant um, through the attrition of um, the, county, the county budget. So it was a necessary feat. I didn't want to do it. So we just divided the workload. So I kind of talked about this by the numbers. In 2016, uh, we had, this is going to start like 2,693 death reports in 2016. Okay, so let that sit there. Of those, we did 294 autopsies um, that came out of our my, my uh, autopsy line item here in Peoria County. In 2017, that number rose to 2,780 death reports, which was positive about 87. And we did 292 autopsies. So we had almost 100 more death reports, but did almost 100 less autopsies, okay? Right now, uh, as of last Friday, we had 1,886 death reports, which I'm, I'm sure we're over 2,000 right now. I think we're at 2,020, um, which is 10% higher than we were last year at this time. And uh, we've done only 132 autopsies. And so if I can predict out uh, to the end of the year, we'll probably do 100 less autopsies this year than we did last year. So what does that mean to you as a taxpayer? It means uh, an autopsy is gonna run around $1,600, because with every autopsy comes toxicology testing, okay? And there's some paperwork and other things that are involved that take that cost up to about that amount, okay? So multiply that by 200 cases, it's a lot of money, right? So the fewer we do, the better, but we gotta make sure we're giving justice to the deceased person, that we're actually giving them an authentic cause of death. So it, there's a, a direct science to it for sure. Um, everything that we do in our office, as the public, you guys see about 1% of what I do every day and what my staff does every day, okay? Which is, which is a lot, we do a lot. Um, I'm operating right now uh, on a $725,000 budget with my annual budget for 2018, okay? 
Um, my operating expenses last year were in the 820s, so I had to ask for more money. And uh, last week, I met with the uh, budget subcommittee of Peoria County and asked for another $125,000 to finish my year. Why do you ask? Right? Why? That's, that's your taxpayer's money. Our deaths are up 10%. Okay? The deaths are up 10%. I have to pay overtime for people who go out in the night, who go out on the weekends, as well as myself. I helped move a body on Saturday morning at Morgan Jones Mortuary that she spoke about. We are working very, very hard. Okay, very hard. There was a, uh, a clause in the uh, contract um, with my deputy staff that wasn't being followed regarding their overtime, which is part of this $125,000. I'm telling you about it now because you're gonna, we didn't pay for anything after the, after the board meeting uh, next week anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is a preemptive view here, okay? So there's a, a clause in the overtime, con uh, overtime contract with my staff. Every time they go out on the call, it's four hours of overtime. Okay. I told my budget subcommittee when this contract was agreed upon uh, with AFSCME with my staff, no financial, per no person with any financial knowledge would have agreed to that, ever. I mean, it, it just, it's just, it's not sustainable. And I'm obligated to follow the contract for my employees, okay? It had not been followed in 12 years, okay? I had to follow the contract. My budget did not support the contract language, so. That's really the bigger part of why I had to ask for money um, from the county. We're gonna renegotiate that contract next year, I promise you that. So why is the coroner called? Anybody know why the coroner is called? You guys are all like so quiet right now. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole list here of reasons and I'm gonna kind of read them off. If you die in the emergency room, they're gonna call my office to report, okay? If you die in a traffic related death, if you're on a, I, I see, out in Princeville, you don't see this in, in Peoria, um, all the golf carts and other types of vehicles running through town, you don't see that. But if you die on that vehicle, that death's gonna be reported to our office. Moped, scooter, anything with an engine or a motor, a lawnmower tips over on top of you, whatever it is, that death's gonna be reported to our office. All neonate and pediatric deaths, okay? And we have an issue in, in Peoria County right now um, for infant deaths. We've had like nine this year, which is horrible. And what do we attribute that to? Well, we go back and we look at the case and we try to figure out why did this happen? A lot of it's co-sleeping, okay? Um, there's no such thing as safe sleeping with an infant in a bed, period. When my two-week-old baby came home to my house, in fact, all my children, there were no bumpers in the crib. There were no pillows. There were no stuffed animals. There was no blankets. Because those are suffocating items for an infant, okay? So pass that out to your... To your your, grand, your, your grandchildren who has our own children, okay? It's an educational barrier that we have in the hospital and going home that needs to be fixed for sure. Um, all deaths related, related to drugs and alcohol are all reported to our office. Um, all deaths related to medical maltreatment and if a nurse in the hospital uh, has a death of her patient who had surgery the day before and she thinks the doctor did something wrong, she's gonna let me know. And we're going to open up the case and we're going to investigate it. So all deaths related to um, a, a, a surgery or a procedure or maltreatment is reported to our office. If you've been in the hospital less than 24 hours and you die, then it's going to be reported. Um, all procedure related deaths, okay? Anything, any procedure that you go and have done, if you die having an MRI or a CT scan or uh, a cath procedure on your heart where you're, they're gonna do a, car, a bypass, uh, not a bypass, but a, uh, a balloon or an angioplasty. Any procedure you have done in the hospital and you die, they're gonna call and report that death to us. And they're gonna leave you right where you laid and right where you died until I get there, okay? Um, all work-related deaths. So if you go into work and you're like, man, this job's killing me, and it does, <laughs> <laughs> and it really happens, uh, that death's gonna be reported to us. Last year, we had a guy, um, a, a garbage man who worked for PDC, um, was picking up trash and got stunned by a bee and had an uh, allergic reaction, an anaphylactic shock reaction, and died from it. So that death was reported. Um, all homicides, all suicides, um, let's see, all deaths uh, in custody or in pursuit with law enforcement. And we've had three law enforcement-related um, shootings um, in the last 18 months. 
So all those deaths, of course, we were uh, involved in with the Illinois State Police. And all deaths in the home, okay, are reported. It doesn't mean we're gonna come to your house, but they will report the death. So that means if you're at home on hospice, uh, if you're out mowing the lawn and you drop, drop over it, I don't wanna die mowing the grass because I hate doing it. Um, if, if in the shower, eating dinner, um, any death at home is going to report it to us. If you die at home and you're not on hospice, we will come to your home, okay? Because we want to come to your home, but we want to investigate. I'm going to get into the how we investigate that uh, in just a second. Um, but all nursing home deaths. We may not go to the nursing home, but if I'm on the phone or my staff is on the phone with the nursing home and they're not being forthright with information, we're literally going to hang up the phone and we're going to go there. Okay? And if anybody in the room remembers anything, remind me to tell you a story about a nursing home death. Okay? Can someone raise a hand and say, I'm going to remind you. Remind, yeah. Okay, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Don't forget. And very, this is a great Writing story. Writing it down. Um, assisted living facilities. They're popping up all over the place because of our population trends. We're going to show up at your assisted living facility, your independent living facility. Um, wherever, wherever your mail comes, wherever you call home, we're going to show up. We're going to show up if there's not a nurse or a doctor present. Any questions about all that? Yeah. So you said if unless they're on hospice, I've never had in 25 years to come out for home health. If there's a nurse present, we won't. Okay, because so hospice and home health. So it's according like, to the Nurse Practice Act, nurses can pronounce death. Okay. So we, we won't come. But again, if you're lying to me on the phone, <laughs> you're coming out. <laughs> I, I know when people lie. I'm coming. I'm show up. <laughs> Um, so yeah. does that mean 25 years I'm safe then, since we haven't seen you? You're perfectly safe. <laughs> yeah. So my parents are in their 90s and they're at home. They have a lady that comes during the day, and that, but they're at home at night so far. Um, if I'm there with them and they die, who do I call? 911. 911? Because the police are going to respond and we're going to respond. Because I don't know you, Cindy. Me. I don't know you. I don't know your relationship with your parents. I don't know if you put a pillow over their face or if you roll her out of bed. I, I don't know you. So we're going to investigate. We're going to come into your home. I know that's a little graphic, but it's the truth. No, no. I just, we, we just wanted to know. Sure, absolutely. 911. Okay. Yeah. So if I just die in my sleep and uh, you have to come then? I do. I do. All right. Do you have a family? Um, your family just needs to call us because, um, believe it or not, I know this is, did anybody ever watch Investigation Discovery or um, Evil Lives Here or any of these shows on, it's, it all really happens. It all truly, we just investigated the death in Peoria County um, where we suspected that the wife was drawing medications out of, out of a port and, and poisoning. I mean, things like this happen all over the place. It ended up not being the case, thankfully, but we investigated. We have to come up here in bed, truly. It's the best place to go, I mean, honestly. <laughs> I'm not saying plan that, but I'm just saying that. <laughs> so what's, what's my actual job? Cause of death and manner of death, okay? Cause of death is what stopped the heart. What medically happened inside of this mess to stop my heart? What caused it? Okay? It could be an aneurysm in your head that caused you to bleed. It could be um, a, a broken femur that broke a vessel in your leg where you bled. It could be a blood clot that traveled to your lung, which we call pulmonary embolism. It could be a heart attack. It could be a stroke. It could be um, blunt force trauma to your head that caused a bleed in your head from a car accident. What caused the heart to stop? It's always a medical event. Okay. Stands to reason that the person standing here should have a medical background to understand what happens in the human body to cause it to die. Because if it was trauma related compared to being a medical, it makes a huge difference. And she talked about post life planning, we're talking about life insurance policies here. Because if you died in a car accident, but you had a heart attack before the car crash, it makes a difference in how that death certificate gets signed. Okay? Galesburg. Galesburg. Mm -hmm. Think of me. <laughs> It's not my county. <laughs> so do you all understand what cause of death is? So manner of death. There's five manners of death. Can somebody name one? Natural causes. Natural causes. Makes up about 80% of about what we do every day in Peoria County is natural cause deaths. Some of them we have to investigate to make sure they're natural. Right? Give me another one. Gunshot. 
which is a homicide. Thank you, Chuck German. Good to see you. <laughs> homicide. Okay. So we, we rule homicide on two on two different avenues. Uh, direct gun violence is a homicide, right? But Veronica and I get done here today. We leave here, we go into Peoria, and we stop at one of the bars, and we start drinking to celebrate this awesome <laughs> event. <laughs> And we have too much to drink, and we leave in my car, and I'm driving, and I drive through a stoplight, and she gets hit on her side of the car because I'm telling the story. That's, that's <laughs> my, my final wishes are, are already perfect. planned. Oh, perfect. Out. <laughs> final, so this makes sense in the story. Oh, okay, good. And she dies. Did I intend to kill her? No. So I had no intent that Jerry Brady, our state's attorney, is going to charge me with involuntary manslaughter, and I'm going to serve 10 to 12 years for killing her. The death's going to be ruled a homicide. Okay, we had a death last year uh, in Bloomington where the person was flown to Peoria because we have a trauma center here. He was riding his bike with his friends and got plowed by a drunk driver. The death was ruled a homicide. You don't have to have intent. Okay, for us to rule that way. So homicide number two, number three, suicide. Suicide. The topic no one ever wants to talk about. The stigma of suicide. Okay. Um, we've had over 40 suicides in uh, Peoria County this year already. We have a problem with, my guess is mental health. You know, I can say it over and over again, we have a problem with mental health and access to mental health, okay? And treatment of things like bipolar, depression, anxiety, okay? Everyone has their own story to tell of why they end up taking their life. And I can tell you I've read a, a lot of suicide notes and I've sat with a lot of families in my office who are 100% dumbfounded that their loved one took their own life. And they look at me puzzled and they don't believe me. Okay? And then I'll hear from them a, a month later and they'll say, you know what, when I look back in hindsight and I think about it, think about our conversations, this one thing happened. And sometimes it's that one pinnacle thing that thinks, well, now I understand why they did it. Okay. It's never one thing. I saw in the news today uh, some story about bullying, and there was, there's been a lot going on in Peoria County about bullying causing suicide. It's not the case. It's multidimensional, okay? I might have a thousand things going on at home that causes me stress as a 16-year-old as a kid, and then that one person, one more match onto my fire is the cause to set me over the edge. It's never one one particular thing, okay? We have a couple more. One big one, accidents. Accidental deaths, okay? The number one accidental cause of death in Peoria County is what? Cars. Car accidents is number three, drug overdoses. <laughs> we had two drug overdoses over the weekend, Saturday and Monday. Okay, from what we're suspected to be either cocaine, fentanyl, or, or heroin and fentanyl, okay? It puts our numbers, it, it, we just keep climbing in numbers. I'm concerned that we had two so close together, like we did in the spring of the year where we were really ramping up, okay, that we might have a bad batch flowing around Peoria again right now, okay? We have a big, big problem. You heard me talk about mental health. Access to treatment is also an issue. Okay, and let me, let me just tell you, if, if someone is in jail, let's say they got picked up for um, a delivery of a controlled substance that was persecuted or prosecuted for six to eight months in jail and they get out and they're a user, where are they gonna go do? They're gonna go use. They detoxed, they're gonna go use, and then their body is not used to what they, whatever they take and it takes their life. That's scenario one. Scenario two, I use, and I go unresponsive and I stop breathing, but my friend has naloxone or Narcan to reverse it, and they give it to me and I wake up, and I say, wow, this sucks. I'm gonna go get treatment, and I'm gonna zoom out to Proctor to get treatment. And Proctor says, yep, we have beds. How are you gonna pay for it? And you're like, well, I don't have a job. I don't have insurance. I have Medicaid. You're gonna get turned away. So what are you gonna go do? Use, okay? So then you go use, you go unresponsive because you take too much or it's mixed with fentanyl, which will nearly kill you, and they give you Narcan again and you wake back up. Man, I want treatment. You're going to go down to the Human Service Center who takes Medicaid for treatment, 
and you're excited, you're gonna get in, and they say, we have a three week waiting list for mail beds. Now what? So do you know what it feels like? Uh, and I'm gonna be very frank here. Has anybody um, been drunk in their life? <laughs> Thank you, Julie, in the back. <laughs> we went to high school together. <laughs> so I, I've been drunk in my life, okay? I have. I've woken up the next morning and felt like crap. Right? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, right? And so what's recommended is a Bloody Mary because you're going to get vitamins. <laughs> No, I want you to follow me here because there's a, there's a logic to this point. So the reason you feel so bad is because you're going through alcohol withdrawal, okay, and dehydration. So a, a Bloody Mary will give you your vitamins and a little dose of alcohol to bring you back up out of that horrible feeling, okay? An addict, a heroin addict, feels that horrible feeling after a night of drinking all the time. All they want to do is feel normal again. So a, a lot of you might be sitting in the world, they're, they're just junkies, and that's not the case. They might have started off with, with a fracture that required an opioid prescription that changed the chemical component of their brain because it's an endorphin, and they're hooked. They're hooked. They, gotta, they have to do whatever they can just to feel normal. That's what that Bloody Mary will do after a hangover. It makes you feel normal so you can function through your day. That's what they're going through every single, that's why I'm working so hard in our community for awareness to break the stigma. So people get what they need and, and I'm, I'm gonna do a, uh, a round table with Representative Mike Yunus, who's an awesome guy, because he believes in this. He believes that we need to change the, the whole paradigm of drug addiction. It's a disorder. And he believes that, and I believe in him, and he believes in me, so we're gonna work together with it. The fifth one's undetermined. Sorry, I got on the soapbox. The fifth one's undetermined. It's where after everything is said and done with the investigation, we can't figure out. We absolutely can't figure it out. Okay. Last year we had one undetermined death in Peoria County. Okay, that's which is awesome. And it was an infant death where we just couldn't figure out really the semantics of what happened um, with this with this poor baby. Um, so the the fewer undetermined deaths, the better. The some of you that heard me speak during the campaign when you have an undetermined death. Um, it's just like a suicide. If you have a life insurance policy, it's not going to pay out. So the more work we do to figure out what happened, the better. The better for you guys, okay? Am I talking too fast? In, how, good? in how many of those deaths does the insurance pay? If you have an accidental death policy and you die an accidental death, that's what's going to be on your death certificate. The big part about manner of death is, is how do I rule it? Is it natural or accidental? Because they're gonna, your life insurance is gonna pay out differently based on if you have an accidental uh, death policy compared to a regular life insurance policy. So it's so important. If a 17-year-old dies of juvenile kids, uh, diabetes, is that a medical or is that an accidental? It's a medical. And we're gonna rule natural causes. Does it, here, that, and that's a, good, that's a really good question. Disease processes that roll through your body is a natural process. Big question I get a lot is if we, if we have an alcoholic, a person who drinks all the time, and they die at home in their, in their recliner watching Jeopardy with a can of Bud Light or whatever it is, and we get into their house and they're dead, and that's all fine and dandy, um, and we take them and we autopsy them because we don't really know what happened and we find a fatty liver, okay? It's a natural cause. Alcohol naturally causes destruction of your liver. It's naturally occurring. Um, I get a question a lot of times about um, bee stings and things like that. Bee stings cause an acute reaction in your body. Okay, and that's the difference really. It's an acute reaction in the body that causes your death. It's gonna be an accident, especially related to an insect bite bee sting. If you get bit by a tick and get Lyme disease and die of the Lyme disease, it's a chronic evolving process in the body. And that's gonna be a natural death. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, just recently, I think I read that uh, there was a skull discovered uh, in the area. And you work for WEEK? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they blew my phone up. Every news station in, in, in town blew my phone up yesterday. So, um, how do you deal with that? I mean, how would you figure out cause? I mean, you, you have a skull. That's all there is. So, thankfully, uh, just just recently, recently, a, a skull washed up in Henderson County and they brought it down to Peoria for DNA testing. I don't know anything about their case. 
Um, we, one of the things I was going to talk about, which I'll briefly talk about right now, is we run a regional morgue in Peoria County. Nine other counties come into our morgue uh, for autopsy uh, services. We are simply the geography for the, for the autopsy, but we don't get any case information. But remember the question, um, remember your question uh, until I'm finished, because we did have a skull wash up in Peoria County last year um, that we dealt with, and I can update on that. And then I can kind of tell you through that process, okay? Sure. So write that down, don't forget. <laughs> um, so what's the investigation look like? Um, this is going to take you from death to death certificate, okay? And there's some, several scenarios here uh, that I want to tell you about. Um, our state statute, Illinois CS5, um, says that when someone is found dead, we go to the place of the dead body. And that's what our state statute tells us to do. Uh, we do a physical exam of the body, we photograph, and we search. So let me take you through some of that. We examine the body. Okay, uh, I take, and what we're looking for are, are several different types of things. I'm looking for any uh, injuries, first of all, okay? We're actually gonna look in your eyes and see if you have any hemorrhage in your eyes that would signify if you were strangled or not, okay? Or if someone had placed a pillow over your face or done any kind of trauma to you. We're gonna look for ligature marks around your neck. I saw that, Carol. I saw that. <laughs> I'm watching her now. We're gonna look for ligature marks around the neck. Okay, we're going to look for any types of signs of injury. We're going to look for needle marks in your arms, um, in between the webbings of your hands and your toes. Um, anything on your body that might have caused your death, we're examining. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I want to know how long you've been laying there. It, it's, it's absolutely relevant how long you've been laying there. There's, two, there's a, uh, three different ways that we do that. Number one is lividity. Okay which is the pooling of blood after your body dies. Clearly when your heart stops, your blood don't keep going, right? That's the, part, that's the point of your heart, right? Your blood stops and it pools, dependently. We call it dependent lividity. So if I lay, if I lay on the ground and I die laying on my back, I would suspect all my blood is gonna pool on the bottom surface of my body, right? Now against the surface, it's gonna be white because the pressure is gonna push it away, but I would expect dependently to be a, a, a color of reddish, bluish, purple. Okay, it sets in two hours. And if I can push on it, on my hand, and it goes away like that, it's non-fixed. Okay, it's gonna fix in about 12 hours. You following me? So if it's there, I know you've been dead at least two. And if it fixes, I know you've been dead at least 12. So now I have a window, right, of the time that you've been dead. That's, that's number, number two. The third thing is rigor mortis, okay? Rigor mortis is a stiffening into the joints after someone dies, okay? It starts in the jaw. Your smallest joint starts here. It starts in about two hours. So if I walk into a home and I grab you and I can't open your mouth, I know you've been dead at least two hours. If I grab your leg and I cannot do this and flex your hip, I know you've been dead at least 10 to 12 hours because rigor will set in your hips last. Now we have another time frame, okay? Temperature plays a huge role in this, huge. The hotter the temperature, the faster the process, okay? The colder, the, the colder it is, the slower it is, okay? The other thing that we look for is insect activity. Something no one ever likes to talk about, but it's our reality every day, and Veronica's shaking her head, yes, she knows. <laughs> You used to see me at home when I got a fly in the house. I'm a maniac. <laughs> so are we. It's not landing on my, no. Um, uh, insect activity, so your body will start to decompose immediately after death, okay? A, uh, a fly will actually come in in your warmest spot and moistest spot on your body after you die. Make sure, here, here's my whole digression point here. Make sure people know where you're at at all times so I don't find you four days later. <laughs> safe for everybody that way, and you can have an open casket then. <laughs> See, everybody wins. So a fly will actually land in the warmest, moistest spot post-mortem in about two hours, okay? So we're talking about your eyes, okay, in your mouth, your nose, your vaginal canal, and your rectum, okay? So once that fly lands in two hours, it's gonna lay its eggs. And then in two or three days after that, depending on the temperature, you're gonna have larvae, and we're talking about maggots. <laughs> and they eat and they reproduce, they eat and they reproduce, they eat and they reproduce, okay? I know that when I arrive on scene, 
and all the police are on the outside of the house, that's a problem. That's a problem. Okay. Um, I arrived at a house one day in, uh, on the south side of Peoria, and all the police were on the outside. I was just getting ready to walk into Coral Life to get a salad. And my mom <laughs> and said, hey, Harwood, you need to come down here to this, uh, to this house. So I get down there, and all the police are on the outside. And the whole front porch, there's like four windows going across. You could not see through it from the flies. Oh. That's, that's reality. And this poor, this poor girl had been, been dead, I think, five days in 90 degree heat. I mean, it, it, it's really our reality. And, and then we have to get them out and bring them back to our office. And, and how we do that is, is really tough. So those are the, those how we de that's how we determine how long you've been dead. It's not, it's, per it's not a perfect science. It's just not. We have to use things like cell phone records. Um, I'm going to grab your phone uh, and see if we can open up your phone to your last phone call made, last uh, text message sent or received. Okay, so those things kind of help us. And, you're, and hopefully the family is there to help us. Hey, I just talked to, uh, I just talked to her you know, three days ago, and that was the last time I heard from her. So we, we try to use that information too. But if you think the families are honest with me, you're absolutely wrong because they're not. Nobody wants to be caught with anything or talk about anything. So. The other thing we're going to do, we're going to do a physical exam of your body, like I said, for uh, injuries and stuff like that. And we're also going to photograph. Okay? I'm going to photograph everything on your body. Front, back, up, down, eyes, mouth, ears, nose, everything gets photographed. I tell my staff if they don't take at least 50 photographs, we've really not done enough. Because it's the only thing we're going to have to look back on, especially once that body is cremated. It's the only thing we're going to have to look back on um, for evidence, for court cases, for things like that. It's our photographs. I'm going to search your room. I'm going to go through everything. Your dresser drawers, under your bed, under your mattress, in your purse, in your wallet. Whatever I can find to help me prove a couple things. Identity of the person, <coughs> right? I need to know who you are. And anything that might have contributed to your death. Empty pill bottles. Or full pill bottles, to be honest. Because if, like this gentleman, he wants to die in his bed. If I, if I go through his dresser drawer and I find, uh, uh, I find all of his pills, and he's on things like lisinopril, Lipitor, um, hydrochlorothiazide, um, things like that, I know he's got some sort of heart disease and high blood pressure. Those things speak to me as a nurse. I understand what medications are, okay? Amlodipine, uh, metoprolol, things like that. I know I can put the picture together. And so then I can call his doctor because it's on the pill bottle and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, I have so-and-so here. They passed away. And he's like, oh, yeah, they had, he had really bad heart disease. We don't need to do anything further. And then it's done. But sometimes if people die by themselves, the families, and a lot of times they're grief-stricken, they don't, they don't want to talk to me. They can't get the words out to talk to me, so we have to kind of do our own thing. And the other thing is, especially with our overdoses, and, and we talk to families all the time who say they, they didn't have an addiction problem. Liar. Because of the stigma, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to give us the information. But then we find it. I find a spoon. I find a bowl of water. I find a cotton ball. I find a needle. I find a lighter. We put it all together. Okay? So that's a big part of it. We search and we photograph everything. Um, we collaborate with law enforcement and, and the fire department and, and the ambulance people as well. We have to. We have to collaborate. Um, and, then, and then we talk to the family. And a lot of times, and, and Veronica knows this, if you come up to a family member and you get down on their level and you use touch and you're genuine about it and you genuinely show care and compassion, they'll talk to you. It makes a difference. <clears throat> Instead of me coming over to her and talking to her like this while she's on the couch crying, it's very intimidating. It's how you present and how you talk. I was, I was in uh, the parking lot of St. Francis over the weekend uh, with one of our homicides. And the family was very, very distressed. Very, very distressed and heartbroken and emotional. And, and you can imagine the scene. Um, and I hugged the brother. It changed the whole scene. It changes the whole dynamic. You try to be genuine about it. So when we work with families to show genuine care and compassion for what they're going through, makes a difference. We get answers that we need. We get the questions answered. Okay. When I walk into a house, I don't talk to the family. When I get to a scene, I don't talk to the family and I don't talk to the police. I just walk right in. I do my 
my own investigation, my own assessments, my own photography, my own everything, and then I'll collaborate with law enforcement. This is what I see, this is what I got, what do you got? What do you know? And then I'll talk to the families. So if I talk to the family first, what happens? If you haven't figured it out, I'm a bleeding heart, okay? I'm gonna get drawn <laughs> right into Veronica here. I'm gonna get emotionally involved and connected to her, and it's gonna make my assessment bias. It's gonna change my whole, my whole investigation. If I come over here and talk to the police first, it's gonna change my whole direction of my case. It is my case until I, and then I collaborate. Otherwise, I'm biased with both of these people with great intention. Yeah. Jamie, what's your time frame when you're usually investigating a scene? 35 to 45 minutes, genuinely, for the most part. And, and, and wrap all this together, it makes a difference. We work, and, and I don't like to talk about a lot of our cases, but this one was it was in the media and it's been done already. So uh, just, to, just to kind of pull all this together, I got a phone call one Sunday morning and said, hey, we have a lady that's been uh, burnt in a house fire. You need to come down to St. Francis. So I meet my deputy down in, in, in the ER at St. Francis. And the nurse is like, hey, the, the guy that was with her is actually uh, in the trauma room. I'm like, great, I'm gonna go talk to him. He's a witness, right? So I go in and talk to him and he's on a ventilator. We can't talk now. So I leave him I leave him be, but what I notice on him is that he's got full frontal burn on him, okay? So I tuck this little nugget of information into my brain and I go into the room where this lady's dead. And the first thing I do is I grab her foot and I try to flex her leg. Because what, what do I want to know? Uh -huh. You guys are listening a little bit. How long has she been dead? I can't flex a hip. I absolutely cannot flex a hip. So she's been dead at least 10 to 12 hours. So I'm immediately suspicious because he's got full frontal burns. She has no burns on her whatsoever and I can't flex a hip. So we're gonna take her back to my, my place for an autopsy, okay? So we take her back, I do my examination, my photographs and everything. We take her back to my office, we do an autopsy. One of the things that we do for anyone who dies in a fire is we do what's called a carboxyhemoglobin. This is where chemistry comes into play in my job, okay? So if you breathe in carbon, carbon has an affinity for your hemoglobin molecule which carries the oxygen in your blood. Following me? Mm -hmm. It takes the place of oxygen. Carbon will take the place of oxygen in your hemoglobin molecule, okay? So if you've been in a fire and you've breathed in anything, that carboxyhemoglobin is gonna be elevated significantly, okay? Or it's gonna be zero. So if it's zero, that would lead the person to believe that they didn't breathe anything in, in the fire whatsoever. If it's elevated, you breathe carbon. If it's, if it's zero, you breathe nothing. So we, we draw the blood, we get, we get the result back, and her carboxyhemoglobin was zero. On autopsy, where they, they do an examination of all the tissue <coughs> under the neck, into the neck and into the eyes, she had broken capillaries in her eyes, okay? She had broken capillaries in her neck, down here. Well, capillaries are very, very fragile in your body and they break under <coughs> pressure. Like this. A strangulation would absolutely cause capillaries to break. And that's exactly what we found in, in her eyes was broken capillaries. She's been dead 12 hours. She didn't breathe anything, and this guy's alive. And you probably don't remember that uh, in the Journal Star several months ago, uh, the guy actually pled guilty to strangling this poor girl and tried to cover it up and set the house on fire. So I tell you that for a couple reasons. It kind of it ties everything together, first of all. But secondly, it makes a difference what we do every day. Any person, any other person might have come in there and said, you know what, she probably has carbon monoxide poisoning, we're not gonna do an autopsy and sent it on the way. And she wouldn't have gotten any, her, her or her family, none of them would have gotten any justice whatsoever. It makes a difference. What my staff and what we do every day makes a difference in justice. Uh, so, I want to take you on a path of three different things here that's really important. How much time do I have? 11.30? 11 noon? 11.15, we have questions. Okay. So, you're dead at home. Let's just paint this picture. You're dead at home. I come into your house. I don't think there's anything suspicious on my exam. I'm going to call your doctor and talk to your doctor about you and your health. Your doctor's going to say, you know what? I think this is natural. 
I'm going to say, well, I think that's, I think the same thing, and we're going to do what we call it. We're going to decline that to a medical death, and we're going to push it off, and we're not going to do an investigation. Okay. That means when we decline that to a medical death, that Veronica and her staff are responsible for getting a hold of your doctor and getting your death certificate signed. Okay. It's off my shoulders. Okay. Scenario number two. We come in and the same thing, you're dead in your bed, you have, you're 104 years old. I used this example at Rotary last week and I said you're 80 and half the room turned their head and they're like, dude, I'm 80. <laughs> so I kept going up, I had to go up to, I had to go up to 98. I was going to say, all right, we're all clear, okay? So I go into your home, you've never been to the doctor, you're healthy as a horse, okay? And I call your doctor who you were at five years ago and the doctor says, you know what, I don't know why they died. I'm not going to sign this death certificate. So then it's on my shoulders. So then I'm going to lose cause. Okay? So that's scenario number two. Then it's dependent upon me to get any kind of medical records from any healthcare provider that you've ever been to by summons. I'm going to summons the records. And then I'm going to lose cause of death on that. So then the timeliness of that death certificate is dependent upon me. Okay? I'm very quick. You betcha. Third scenario is autopsy, okay? I can't figure out why you're dead. I think, it, I think we need to investigate. We're gonna do an autopsy, okay? So we're gonna bring your person or your loved one back to our office, and we're gonna have one of our forensic pathologists do the autopsy. The turnaround time of that result in its entirety is about three to four weeks, sometimes five weeks, okay? Your funeral home, will, uh, we, will, we will issue a temporary death certificate to your funeral home. And that's what we can do until we get a final cause of death back. It's going to be at least four to five weeks for a permanent death certificate on an autopsy case. It's out of my hands. Our, our toxicology goes to a forensic lab in Pennsylvania, and then they, they send me the results back to my computer, and then we, we can issue a cause of death. We absolutely cannot issue a cause of death when we do an autopsy without that final result. So. <coughs> The less we do, the better, obviously, because then the death certificates get turned over quicker. Does the family have a choice whether they can have an autopsy or not? So she asked if families have a choice for autopsy, and the answer is no. Um, we, we're law enforcement officers, um, and if we find that we need to do an autopsy, I'm going to do an autopsy. But I'm going to present it to you in a manner that we're on the same page. Okay? And I've been in the job almost two years, and I would say 99% of the people have been on my page. Okay? It's a tough conversation. Very, very tough conversation to have. But my reasoning for doing them are very, very particular. Why does Jamie want to do an autopsy? Because I'm suspicious of something. I have a gut feeling about something. I have knowledge of something, and I want to know what it is. A lot of times, I want you to have closure. Okay? Jamie, is yeah. there a flip side to that? Could, the fam could you say, yeah, this is up in the, in the family say, it's a great question. Can the family say, I want one, is basically what she's asked. And the answer is yes. Um, we will actually, here's the good thing. If you die in the hospital, and I say, you know what, I'm not going to do an autopsy, you can ask the hospital staff um, to have it done in-house at the hospital. Okay? It happens frequently. Um, if you die at home and you want an autopsy and I say, I'm not going to do it, Peoria County will actually do a private one for you at your expense. Here's the thing, if I can list out 75 different reasons of why you're dead, uh, we just had a case today, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, acute kidney injury, um, renal failure, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, atherosclerotic heart disease, non-compliance with diabetes. There's six <clears throat> reasons why you're dead. Okay, I'm not autopsying you when I can list out six reasons why you're dead. But if the family says we really wanna know, Peoria County will host that autopsy in our morgue uh, to the tune of five grand. And we just increased our morgue fee too. Okay. So if you have a suspicious death and, and you do an autopsy, who pays for that? We do. Peoria County, I have a line item for medical services and I, we pay for it. And I can, I can assure you, I am very particular about when I autopsy. I heard Veronica say yes. How much, how, it's a lot, it's, a, it's, it's expensive, but, but 
I, do, I never weigh the cost of it for justice, ever. I can tell my, my county board, hopefully none of them are listening right now. We can do as many <laughs> autopsies as they want and they have to pay for them. That's, and that's period. But is it, is it necessary? If I can tell you why and how your loved one died, I'm not gonna do an autopsy. And I can do that with the most certainty, okay? How long did they take? Um, about two to three hours. It just depends if it's a, if it's a gunshot homicide. Um, it could take up to, up to that long. Give my company. You have to send everything away. I can't do the test. It's a forensic lab. So we could we could send, some of our blood does get sent to St. Francis. All of our pathology testing gets done at St. Francis. Um, they do our carboxyhemoglobins, they'll do on the spot, right then and there for us. Um, and their fees are reasonable. And, and you know, we've, we've not bid out to Unity Point. Um, we've always just used St. Francis because they're very, very reasonable in their pricing. They understand, they understand, you know, the cost of things like that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is organ and tissue donation. Um, I know many of you sitting here thinking um, you're not a candidate for organ or tissue donation, and it's absolutely wrong. Um, we, we, we present to the family, um, someone's going to call you regarding um, organ and tissue donation of your loved one. And we leave it up to the uh, tissue don uh, organ people to have that conversation with you and we pull ourselves out. But we always make a referral. Here's the thing. Um, if you die at home and under 24 hours, which is what our window is, your corneas can go to someone who's blind. Okay? Your heart valves can go to someone who needs a valve. Your uh, long bones, skin, cartilage. If anyone's ever had an ACL tear and needed a repair or a replacement or anything like that, that's what they're used for. But we only have 24 hours uh, to get that referral done, okay? And if, and if unfortunately, if the body goes to the funeral home, and no offense to Veronica, but they're gonna embalm that body right away for obvious reasons because they have to, and then you change your mind, we can't, we can't use it. So have that, have that, just as much as you're having pre-planning discussions with your family, you need to talk about organ and tissue donation. Okay. If you've signed back your license or you've gone to the facility and they've said, do you want to be an organ or tissue donation? You say yes. Your name goes into a national registry. So when you die and I make that referral, it's called first person consent. It means your family cannot not do it. It's, we will go ahead with tissue donation and organ donation because you've, you've signed your license and it's first person consent. Now the, the problem with that is, is when we call your family or when the gift of hope calls your family to talk about it, they're going to want medical history. Well, it's your right not to give it to them. And if they don't get it, they're not going to go forward with their, don with their donation. Okay? In order to donate your organs, you have to be brain dead on a ventilator. Okay? And then they go through a battery of tests. They do two different uh, uh, blood flow tests in the brain to make sure you're brain dead before they'll proceed with organ donation. Brain death is brain death is brain death. Okay? When your brain's dead, you're dead. There's no second time of death when the heart comes out or anything like that. Okay. Very, very important. There's 77,000 people in the United States right now waiting on a kidney. It's a lot. One less because of me. I'm not saying y'all have to go get tested and get your kidneys locked out. I'm just saying. Um, it's important. It's important to me. But we don't pressure families about it either. It's a very, very personal decision. If you don't feel like donating, we don't care. We got, we got five more people dead today, okay? We're gonna give you the opportunity, and then we're gonna leave you with that decision, we're gonna move on, okay? I feel like I'm giving you a ton of information. I could probably talk for another hour, to be honest. Questions, Sandy? Um, do you ever have any anyone that has donated their body to science? It's a really good question, and when we talk about money, <laughs> um, we have two companies, we have two companies that we use um, after the time of death is declared, uh, we'll make that phone call and we make it happen, for sure. And they'll actually, um, we actually sign a cremation permit um, for them, and they'll actually send the cremains back. And, and just to tell you too, uh, amongst that question, remind me to tell you, we answer our phone for death reports 10 to 12 times a day in a 24 hour period, okay? That's a lot, 10 to 12 times a day. She talked about cremation permits, okay? Every cremation permit that comes through Peoria County sits on my desk, the death certificate will, and I authorize it. That's why there's probably a $50 fee for it. 
Yes. Which I hasn't think. been raised in a long time. It has not. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm talking to my legislators right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them lands on my desk. If there's an unnatural cause of death on that death certificate and it's labeled natural, I'm going to open up the case and we're going to delay things a bit until I can figure out what I want to do. Okay? Because I certainly don't want your loved one to be cremated uh, and something not to come forth that was actually the, 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 tri the real cause of death. Okay, I'm gonna, we, we need to know. I had a lady come into my office one day, um, bawling her eyes out, I'm sitting on my couch with her in my office, and I'm, I'm really sorry, she says, I really think that my nephew killed my husband. That's what she said. And I said, well, I'm, I'm open, I, I mean, I, I've never exhumed a body before, but I'm excited about it, so let's get it going. <laughs> and she's like, well, he was cremated. <laughs> <laughs> something that you think is suspicious that with your loved one's death, I want you to tell me, frankly tell me what you find to be suspicious. And I'm going to tell you another example. I had a person die at a hospital, went in for a simple procedure of a G-tube. They, the, they put a little hole here and they stick it into your abdomen, okay, and you're good. Um, procedure went fine. Through the night, the person declined and they died uh, in the middle of the night, okay. I was on the phone with the hospital staff who said, you know, everything went perfectly fine. This guy had a multiple multiple things going on with his medical history. The doctor didn't see any concern at all uh, whatsoever. And I'm like, all right, well, we're gonna just decline this to a medical death and leave it alone. Family calls me the next morning and I'm having a conversation with the family. The doctor says, well, the nurse kept saying, you know, we gotta keep giving him blood and his hemoglobin was dropping through the night. I go, well, where was he bleeding from? He says, well, I don't know. So well, the nurse never mentioned this to me, that he had a drop in his hemoglobin, that he had potentially some internal bleeding, hardening of the abdomen, which was all significant to me. Well, where's the guy at now? Well, he's at the freaking funeral home. And he's already been embalmed. But we brought him back to our office anyway, and we autopsied him. And what our pathologist found was microscopic bleeding in the tissue to prove that he was bleeding while he was alive absolutely changed our manner of death from natural causes to accidental. They hit a vessel. They had to have, or there would have been no microscopic bleeding in the abdomen. So you have to give us the information, for sure. What else? Back to the skull, your partial remains, and what do you do? So, partial remains. So we had a skull wash up, wash up and I said wash. The southern <laughs> So we had um, a skull wash up in Peoria County last year. Actually, it might have been the year before. And uh, that's all we had was a skull. Uh, we knew there was teeth, hair, and uh, that's all we had. So what we did is we, we uh, consulted with, obviously, the Peoria County Sheriff's Office was there uh, with our investigation as well. And uh, forensic odontologist, which is a study of the teeth postmortem, and um, DNA testing. So we have a DNA profile, we have dental profiles, panoramics of everything in the mouth, but that's all we have. So uh, what we were able to do, really with the effort of, of the, sheriff off, the sheriff's office, was uh, to create a profile from the DNA. What does this person <coughs> theoretically look like? What color are they theoretically? What's the color of their eyes? What would they look like today? Things like that. So we have all of this information, we just don't have anything to compare it to. So we're kind of just in the balance. Right now with that nursing home case. You didn't remind me, Cindy. I was waiting for you to answer. All right. So um, we had a call uh, for a person who was deceased in a nursing home. My staff shows up. This was before my time, uh, but just to give you an example of what really what could happen, not really happen. I think they have great care. What could happen is he arrived at the nursing home and uh, the lady was laying in her bed. It was the middle of the night and the nursing home administrator was there. Automatically a red flag. Okay. The administrator is there in the middle of the red flag. So he actually goes in and uh, looks at the body, goes back out and asks the staff, what's this lady's name again? So uh, they tell her, and the name on the door was not the name in the bed, which is another problem, right? So he does the examination, and he notices um, that she's got a mark around her neck. The staff says she wheeled herself out from the dining room um, in the afternoon, laid in bed. She obviously had laid in the wrong bed. We're sorry we didn't tell you that. Um, and then we just found her dead. Well, what he noticed was a, a ring around her neck, okay? So after further questioning, what came about was she actually had a gate belt attached to the wheelchair into her waist, and when she wheeled herself into the room and she wanted to get out of bed, she slid herself out of the chair and strangled herself. Oh. What they did 
because they took the dog off and threw her in bed and made it look like it was natural. So when they when the, when the nursing homes and I'm not dogging on nursing homes, you know, I think we have a really really great skilled care in our area. We're fortunate to have so many to choose from. Um, but we ask questions. We ask very pointed questions um, about what happened, just for that reason. Other questions? Um, just say like grandpa and grandma are in their 70s, and maybe grandpa's had a little heart problems through the years, but anyhow, it's getting along fine. But grandpa and grandma go to bed in the morning, grandma wakes up, grandpa's obviously died in his sleep. It, is there some law that says you have to report that death as soon as you see that it is a death? Or can she call her son who's in Chicago and she scares it? Well, I'll be down in two and a half hours, but I'm coming, Mom. Is that okay? You need to call right away. The death needs to be reported right away, but I'm going to tell you, um, I, I got called to a death, um, I can't remember where, on the West Bluff uh, in Peoria. And when I got there, I walked in, walked of the house, the daughter um, of the deceased lady met me at the door, and um, she said, gave me the information, mom's dead, she's back in the back bedroom. So I, I always take my notes on my cell phone, so I always have them, so I'm typing away, listening to her, talking to her, and uh, we get back to the back bedroom, and this lady, I've never seen such a well-preserved person in my life. Um, it looked like Veronica did some work on this woman before, before I got here. I know she did And I said, when did your mom pass away? And she said, well, yesterday. And I go, what? <laughs> yesterday? You're supposed to call right away. Um, there's no legal ramification that I know of. There very well could be, and I'll, I'll have to email you and let you know. Uh, but let me tell you what I'm going to do. If I arrive in your home, and you tell me your son or daughter is coming from Chicago or coming from St. Louis, um, I might very well wait there with you, okay? So they can they can come and they can see them um, in that element, okay? I, I can assure you that probably wasn't prior practice in Peoria County. I can assure you it's probably not not practice in a lot of uh, other corners' office because they're busy, okay? I have a staff. I can I can afford to sit there with you and wait, okay? And I think I, I think sometimes. The reasonable thing to do and the compassionate thing to do are on different planes. But I'm going to choose this route most of the time. Yeah. So not on a home health side, but on a personal side, following up on that question, and then you tell me if this is incorrect, so to not do this, but a lot of times on a personal level, if we already have a relationship with the local nursing home, or no, no I'm on like with CJ, yeah. with the local funeral home, We'll call, I'll call them, I would call them, or I've seen families call them, and then that family would, or that funeral home would say, you know, would t sometimes direct them. Because not everybody, I find that, you know, everyone's first instinct is not to call the coroner's office. They just need to call 911. But the, okay. We will direct so people call that 9 way. And, and you tell them to call We will. If we receive a call, a lot of times if it's from a family member, we'll ask if they were on hospice. If they say no... We'll ask if the coroner has been notified. If they say no, we say you need to call 911. Or do you give them the option of calling the coroner themselves? A lot of times we won't give out personal that's numbers right. like that, and it's just then call you have the police, okay, you have call 911. I mean, my cell phone that's number is on our website. It's on my Facebook page. So <laughs> if, if you happen to get it and you call me, I'm going to say, great, I'm on my way. And I'm also going to call the police. Because I will tell you from experience, if we call 911 all the time, I've got the 911 um, head of 911 on me because we are in independent living facilities and 911 does not want to be called. They want us to call. They want um, independent apartments that they do not want to be called for that. They want See, us to call the coroner's the thing, office. Here's the thing I would tell 911, if they're in their independent living apartment, that's their house, you have to call. I mean, it's, it's a reportable death. It's, it's a violation of the statute if you don't report. Hmm. Okay, um, interesting. You can call me directly Yeah. if you feel more it's it's, like, it's Tazewell County, so it's not it's not you, but it, it's interesting. Yeah, it's Tazewell County, but I mean it's an, it's an appointment I've had before with that corner because yeah, they prefer not to be called. So that's just I found that curious that I, I'm I'm different than most people. <laughs> to be honest, yes. So once the coroner gets there, okay, and then and it's a home death. I mean, it's a natural Um, so once the coroner gets there. Excuse me, the patient I had. So the family wanted time to say goodbye to her. Call 
on the on the twenty one one called the coroner. The coroner came out, but the coroner did not this previous briefing. The coroner would not give them any more time to say goodbye to the family as the family was coming in front door to where the patient was. But then while he was there he called the funeral home. And once the funeral home left with the body, then it was okay. So what I'm saying is if the coroner's there, you can't leave until the funeral is there and take the body. You can't have that time frame where they can be still with them, knowing that they've called the funeral home, knowing that you know the funeral home. So here's the thing. To me, it's about relationships. Okay, and what's my relationship with Preston and Hammy? What's my relationship with Haskell Hot? What's my relationship with Wolsey Wilton? Okay, a lot of times, it's gonna take an hour or so for the funeral home to get there anyway, okay? And that's really been my experience. As much as they bust their butts to get to where they're going, it takes time, unfortunately. Um, we're gonna give you that time to a reasonable sense. We, um, a lot of times, I leave, and I wait, and the funeral home comes, and I'm already gone, okay? See, and that didn't happen in this case. They refused to leave, so the family wasn't My staff to today in Peoria County, they leave. Okay. If, if it's okay with the funeral home, and the and the reason I, I, I've mentioned the word relationships in the, in the funeral home particularly is I'm gonna get on the phone with Bert, and I'm gonna say, hey Bert, I'm over at such and such address and, and whatever, um, is it okay if I leave? I ask the question, if he says yes, we'll handle it, but I'm gonna leave, okay? And that buys you, that really does buy you a lot, a lot more time. Right. And like I said before, we answer 10 to 12 calls a day. We got places to go. I mean, unless you got a good crock pot meal going and it's just coming off the coming out of the <laughs> I actually had a family offer me a cocktail one night. <laughs> which was really kind of nice. I mean, but no, I can't I can't drink. Bloody Mary. Vodka tonic or something like that. But, um, I, I, I just try to make it as comfortable as possible. But yes, I, I will leave. Uh, and this this question came up too with, with uh, hospice deaths. Can the hospice nurse leave? And the answer is yes. If you don't mind, I'd chime in just to maybe give a reasoning to why they might have not left. Is um, when the death occurs at a house, typically a funeral director will have two people come out to the home. Just because if there's stairs or anything like that, it just makes it easier and a lot smoother. So if only one funeral person came out, they might have asked that the coroner stay to assist them. Because I know sometimes with us being a smaller funeral home, if Bert and Eric are out on a service and it's just me at the funeral home, I need a second person. So I might ask him to stay to assist me. So, okay. Can be sometimes. That's why I thought I'd mention it. I always, I always try to put myself in the position of the person um, who's bewildered by the death. And I can tell you from my own experience, it doesn't matter if it's a sudden death or a chronic illness that causes the death, it's still the shatter of glass in your life. So I put myself in that position with the person who's asking me to go a little bit above and beyond for them and their experience. And that that's what it's about for me. What's your experience gonna be like for this particular instance? It's the only time that it ever happened to me. I was very surprised. A lot of times my staff will call me and be like, hey, the funeral home's going to be an hour or so or two hours. Do you mind if I leave? And I'm like, yeah, go. It's okay with the funeral home. And, and then there's been cases where they'll call me and say, uh, the, family, the family wants us to keep the body here for a while. Okay. Is it your death? Is it, is it your? No. Is, is it theirs? Well, yes. Well, then give them their time. It's their experience. It's, it's their once in a lifetime. So if it's a, a natural death at home, are the police going to be coming after you call them? They will. They will. They, they will. will. And, and, and a lot of times um, they'll walk in and then they'll walk right back out. But they're, they're there for the same reason I am, justice. Yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah. When it's a suicide at home, the police come, the coroner comes, anybody else come? No. Um, uh, cr uh, the funeral home will come sometimes. Um, it, it, I'm a little bit different with my suicides and, than prior practice and, and then and really with other counties. Um, I, I try to come to every single suicide for two reasons. So I can do my own investigation in tandem with my staff 
One of them's been there 26 years, the other one's been there 21, one's been there seven. They know their business, right? I want to work with them in tandem so we can investigate together. I want to make sure that what we're seeing and what we're investigating is, is authentically true to what it is. Okay? The second reason I want to be there is for the family. I want to be there to help them start that first step forward. So I'm always going to go. Um, our our uh, hanging suicides, I 99.9% .9 of the time will not autopsy a hanging, especially if I have a note. And if I have dialogue from the family about um, a history of attempts or depression or, or behaviors that led up to that, I probably won't autopsy a hanging. Um, gun suicides, I will autopsy, okay? Because I want to make sure that the right-handed person that shot themselves in the right temple, we check for stifling, we check for gunshot residue um, on hands because we're building a proof case. Can we prove it? It's a matter what I think, not just what I can prove. Okay. Overdose um, suicides, we generally autopsy. So, yes? Well, with all of the medical questions and explanations ex that you've shared with us, I would hope that there are medical requirements for someone to be the coroner. What are the requirements? So, I think that's a great question, and I'm going to tell you um, I hate politics. I, I really do. Because it doesn't matter if my core is Republican or if my core is Democrat. It doesn't matter in what I do every day. I, I can tell you I do it as conservatively and as authentically and genuine and compassionately as possible. Okay? First of all, um, I've never walked into a house and said, ooh, Democrat. <laughs> not touched anybody that voted for so and so but it is it is a political position and it is um, a partisan position the qualifications require me to be registered to vote in my county um, a resident in my county and 18 years of age or older is what's required for me to do this job every day that's it that's no medical requirement no telling you the truth. Wow. <laughs> you have to choose a you have to choose partisan. You have to you have to run a political race. You have to get elected. You have to go through everything that you see going on right now. That's it's absurd. true. And it, it is a it, it, it's absurd in my brain. Um, and somebody at Rotary asked me, do you think you should be an appointed position? If the right person's elected in the position, the answer is no. If the wrong person is, then yes. <laughs> I absolutely think it should be nonpartisan. As well as our sheriff race should be nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, Susie and I will attest to 25, 30 years of the business. We like it to be somebody medical because they understand when I call and I say, my patient, you know, just died and this is, you know, what happened. They know when I'm talking medicine, they know when I'm talking medication. They understand what COPD is. They understand what congestive mm -hmm. heart failure is. Mm -hmm. and they, I can relate to them, and it makes it's, it's really so true. much smoother. A lot of times, my, I'll just have my staff tell me, just read me the medications, and I'm clicking them off of my head. I'm like, all right, there, there's nothing to do here, to be honest. And, and we count pills. A lot of times, we count pills, especially the narcotics. We're going to make sure intentionally. Anybody want to come for a tour? <laughs> we have we have last year we had over a thousand people through our building for, uh, with tour groups. Bradley Ollie's group um, has come through several times. Um, ICC's adult learning learning program. Um, about every every large high school in Central Illinois has come through. Even ones across the river. We had Morton and East Peoria come last year. Um, a lot of the high school kids come, and we talk about. I get to get on a soapbox and talk to them about. Texting and driving, drinking and driving, um, uh, uh, opioids and taking medications and smoking and drinking and all these things that kids talk to kids about and um, give them an, an honest education about grief and what grief looks like. And it might be it might be some of their first time talking about grief and what it's like to lose someone and what that process looks like. So it's pretty fun. Anybody else? Okay, we want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you.